If you've watched one video on beginner woodworking tools, you've seen them all until now. There's one tool that I think that 99% of woodworking videos are getting wrong when they're telling you which tools to buy. I'm gonna use only the tools from this toolbox to build a project and show you how you can start building right away so you can recoup your investment in one weekend. In this box are the tools that every beginning woodworker should have. I'll also share a bonus tool that can speed up your projects and make you feel like a woodworking pro like Drew Witt. I'm not a pro, I'm just an actor on YouTube. See, makeup. I mean, who doesn't wanna be like Drew Witt? I'm gonna assume that you already own a tape measure. If you don't, I suggest you get one that has markings on both sides and includes the micro measurements, the entire length of the tape measure. Oh, not that yet. All right, another less sexy but necessary tool, let's talk about squares. There's lots of different types of squares from carpenter squares to combination squares to my favorite, the speed square. It was originally designed for framing and includes specific measurements for rafters and roof pitches. The markings and angles allow you to quickly and accurately measure and mark lines for various angles. So don't think that it's only for 45 and 90 degree cuts. However, since I mentioned 90 degree cuts, as the name implies, a speed square can help you square up boards and make sure that they're at a 90 degree angle to each other, as well as allow you to run your saw along the square as you cut. By holding the speed square up against the edge of the board, you can guide your saw along the square's edge, ensuring a straight and accurate cut. To find different angles, you put the pivot point along the piece and rotate the speed square until you find the angle. Then you can transfer that marking and make sure that you have a perfect match. A speed square is only gonna set you back about 15 bucks. The next tool is a bit controversial. I took one out of the Whitworks playbook and reached out to my community tab to ask which woodworkers prefer and everybody said a circular saw. While I agree that a circular saw is a must-have tool, if I were only to pick one for the beginner woodworker, it would be the jigsaw. A jigsaw? Huge mistake. <gasps> okay, let me explain. I haven't said that a circular saw isn't in the toolbox yet, but let me tell you why I positioned the jigsaw ahead of the circular saw for the beginner and then I'll show you some things to consider when choosing the right saw for you. This is a circular saw. I'm gonna show you real quick what it sounds like when you turn it on and make a quick cut. If that intimidates you, that's because it should. It can cut incredibly fast and accurately, and if you think that's all it will cut, you'd be wrong. A circular saw doesn't stop if it comes in contact with your skin, and it can turn your hand into hamburger meat. Not only is the blade barely protected by this guard, as a beginner woodworker, you may not be aware of many of the dangers of a circular saw, like kickback. Kickback is a dangerous and often unexpected reaction that can occur while using a circular saw or table saw. It happens when the saw blade gets pinched or bound in the wood being cut, causing the blade to forcefully kick back toward you. This can happen in a split second and can cause serious injury. As you're cutting through the wood, if the wood starts to pinch the blade, you're in the danger zone. The best thing to do at this point is to release the trigger and stop the blade. One of the most common ways people get themselves in the danger zone when using a circular saw is by positioning their non-dominant hand behind the saw to hold the offcut. If there is any kickback, that saw is going to go right back over that hand and send you to the ER. You already saw me use a circular saw to cut one of those pieces, so let's see how the jigsaw does. Now, this is a jigsaw. In contrast to the circular saw, this is probably a lot less intimidating. As far as kickback goes, the teeth are pointed away from you for starters. With a jigsaw, your blade could become pinched in the material, and the worst that's likely to happen is the jigsaw takes you for a ride. The blade will stop moving in the wood, but the tool will start to articulate up and down. You still have to be very careful not to put your fingers in the way of the blade, but the best way to avoid this is by positioning the workpiece in a way where your other hand is well away from the blade. It will be slower than a circular saw, but you can cut a lot more projects with a jigsaw than a circular saw because of its ability to cut curves. Choosing the right jigsaw can be tricky because there's lots of different styles. Not only can you choose from different grip configurations, but you can select from corded or cordless. 
It really doesn't matter if you prefer DeWalt, Makita, Milwaukee, Bosch. What does matter as you're thinking about the different power tools we're gonna to cover, you wanna consider the battery platform that you're on. You'll wanna make sure that you get one that will fit with a specific battery platform that can be used for some other power tools as you grow your tool collection. The Bosch runs about $159, but there are other options starting around 99 bucks. Next up is a drill set, which includes both a drill and an impact driver. So technically it's two tools. A drill is used to make holes in wood or drive screws. They'll either have a keyed or keyless chuck that holds the bit in place. A power drill is an adjustable speed tool that drills and drives in fasteners. An impact driver is used for driving screws and other fasteners and is generally more compact than the standard drill. The impact driver has a hammering motion while it operates to help drive the screws in easier with more torque than a standard drill. Unlike the drill, impact drivers do not have a chuck and impact drivers use a quick change clamp that holds the bits and driver bit with a hexagon shank. Impact drivers can make driving in long screws and lag bolts much easier than a standard drill. I happen to like Makita, although someone will probably leave a comment on why Milwaukee or Festool are better. I got Makita several years ago before the Milwaukee Army got real strong, and since I was already on the Makita platform, I'm gonna stick with it for now. Of course, you can see that I have the Milwaukee Packout Box, and that's mainly because I wanted to see someone get really upset that I'm putting my Makita tools in a Milwaukee box. Depending on the set that you get, you can look to spend between $200 and $300 for an 18 volt set like this with a battery charger. This set will also come in handy when you use it with the next tool that I'm gonna to talk about. What are we up to, like 450 bucks already? We still have a lot of tools to go. All right, next up is the router. Another intimidating tool purchase can be the router. Not only will the sound of the router make you pucker a little bit, you also have to be incredibly careful where you position your hands. Some routers are poorly designed and have lots of small areas you can get your finger in. These can be scary to use. You need to be careful with these because you have a sharp bit spinning at thousands of RPMs. If you're not comfortable with the tool, you may wanna wait on this purchase and invest in a couple of small hand planes or a block plane so that way you can get some good chamfered edges. Whenever you start the router, it needs to be firmly seated on your workpiece, but the bit should not be resting along the cut edge. Once the bit starts spinning, it's important that it's not in contact with the material or it can fly out of your hand. As far as I know, there's no routers that will stop spinning if you're not holding it. If there are any tool manufacturers out there listening, it would be awesome if you could design a router that shuts off when it detects that it's out of control. That would be amazing. You should feel resistance from the router as you move around the workpiece. If the router starts to take off, you're going the wrong way. For palm routers, having a cordless option is nice, but since I have a lot of power outlets in my shop, I don't have a huge need for cordless. Routers do make a lot of sawdust, so if you can splurge for a cordless option, you could do your routing outside and blow the sawdust in your neighbor's yard. This is a great place to start and will only cost you about $140. Oh, the pocket hole jig. Don't let fancy woodworkers tell you that you're not a real woodworker if you use pocket holes. Pocket holes have been used for centuries. They just haven't had all of these cool types of jigs like we have nowadays. These hymnal racks on the back of these old church pews were attached with pocket holes and they were made over 80 years ago. I know firsthand the quality of these pews because I had to strip them down, take them apart, cut them to different sizes, and create new ends for each one using the same joinery methods that looked consistent with what they used then. The pocket holes on these church pews worked great then and they work great now. A pocket hole jig is used for creating strong hidden joints between pieces of wood. It's perfect for building cabinets, shelves, and other furniture. With a pocket hole jig, you can create a strong joint without the need for complicated mortise and tenon joints. That's a fancy way of saying a piece of wood fits into another piece of wood to connect them. The basic concept of a pocket hole system is it includes a jig that positions a hole at an angle to connect the adjoining piece. There are various depth options on each jig that references both the thickness of the material you're drilling into as well as the piece you'll be connecting to. 
This creates a relatively solid connection between the two pieces of wood, but you would usually use this type of joinery with glue. The pocket hole screws will keep everything positioned while the glue sets. Of course, you can use this type of connection in places where you may want to disassemble or reassemble in the future. There are a few different brands and types of jigs from the beginner version, like this Craig Pocket Hole Jig R3, which is about $35 to more advanced setups like this Craig Foreman at $400. You're probably not going to be making hundreds of pocket holes right away, so that type of system is probably overkill for you as you get started in woodworking, but there are a couple of great options that I would recommend right in the middle of the pack. Personally, I would go ahead and skip the $400 Foreman and look at the 520 Pro or 720 Pro. The 520 Pro system is great because it's portable and comes with the accessories you need to get started. It includes a clamp, the bits, and a couple of packs of screws in the most common lengths. You make adjustments to the jig for the depth of cut, bore the hole, and use the drill bit to connect your pieces. The 720 Pro, on the other hand, is also a nice system because it functions more as a desktop version of the 520 Pro and takes a lot of the guesswork out of figuring out your depths. The 520 Pro costs around $99 and includes the jig, two boxes of screws, a clamp, and the bits you'll need. The 720 Pro is $149 and includes all of that plus a vacuum connection and the wings to help you stabilize your workpiece. You can start building some cabinets or bookshelves for customers easily with this setup. One of the first commission jobs that I had for woodworking was a set of bookshelves mostly made with pocket holes. And I made more money on that job than the pocket hole jig cost. So a win. You've probably heard how awesome sanding can be. There are countless videos of people having loads of fun sanding on the internet, but I'm sure you're asking yourself, how can I be part of that? Sanding is an important step in woodworking and it helps smooth out rough surfaces and prepare the wood for staining or painting. If you're using a jigsaw or even a circular saw, you're going to have some cleanup before your project is ready for finish. An electric sander can make this process much faster and more efficient than traditional block sanding. Don't bother getting a cordless sander because sanding will kick up lots of dust so you're going to want to connect it to dust collection anyway. Since you're going to connect it to dust collection, a cordless version is completely useless. You're going to be tethered to a hose, so you might as well be tethered to a cord as well. There are different types of electric sanders, including belt sanders, orbital sanders, and palm sanders. Go ahead and skip the belt sander and palm sander categories and get yourself a random orbital sander. This type of sander operates by going in a circular direction as well as randomizing the scratch pattern by moving in various directions as the sander moves across the surface. This will help minimize scratches. I said minimize because it won't completely eliminate them. What you need to do is focus on the abrasives. The type of sandpaper you use can make a big difference in the quality of finish you get. There are hundreds of different options for clamps, but I'll highlight a few of my most used clamps here. If you're just getting started, there's an underrated hero in clamps, and that's these pipe clamps. You can attach these clamps to a stick of pipe and they work great for customizing various lengths. One of these clamps will only cost you about 15 to 20 bucks and then you can cut your pipe to length. If you don't have a way to cut your pipe, most home centers will either sell shorter lengths or cut the pipe for you. So you won't be limited by the length of some of the other options I'm going to mention. These small clutch style bar clamps are great for holding down small pieces and I use them frequently to hold down a straight edge for quick cutting. They're also known as F clamps because of their shape. F or F? I'm not sure. There are also strap clamps, face frame clamps, track saw clamps, and these old wood hand screw clamps. My dad gave me these clamps years ago and I used them way more than I thought that I would. There are also some additional types of clamps used in woodworking like these parallel clamps, which are by far my favorite. These clamps are great for assembling panel glue ups and projects like cutting boards. But I don't think that these are the best option if you're just getting started. Getting started, I recommend pipe clamps because you're going to be able to buy more pipe clamps and they're going to work great for a wide variety of projects because of their unrestricted length. You don't want to go ready to clamp something up only to find that you're a few inches short on clamping capacity. If we add four of these clamps for about 20 bucks a piece, that will be about 80 bucks plus you can add a about a $30 piece of pipe and we're going to check and see where we are on our budget. Now for the bonus tool. 
I think a circular saw is a necessary tool for the shop, but because there is a version of the circular saw that I think is way better than what most people start off with, I wanted to bring in a subject matter expert to talk more about it. Drew, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here, just looking for my safety glasses, can't find them. Yeah, since you own about three dozen track saws or so, I was hoping that you could tell them a little bit more about it. Just buy a track saw. Okay, well thanks for that deep insight. This blanket ladder was built with only the tools mentioned in this video. I made a different version of this with some advanced tools, including the Festool Domino everyone dreams about. But if you're just getting started with woodworking and want to make some awesome projects around the house, or maybe just want to make some projects to sell and pay off those tools, the tools that are in the box that we talked about are only the tools that you need right now. Oh, and I also checked and we did stay under budget. If you want to learn more about breaking down sheet goods or how to use a track saw or what it is, check out this video right here.